I hope this doesn't change anybody's attitudes about me. But back in the late 1970s and through the 1980s, the rock band Foreigner was one of my favorites. With hit songs like Cold as Ice, Feels Like the First Time, Hot Blooded, they were one of the most popular bands at the time. And yet, their biggest hit to date was not any of them hard rock songs. It was a ballad called, I Want to Know What Love Is. The song hit number one in both the United Kingdom and the United States. It remains one of the band's best-known songs. It's listed in Rolling Stone Magazine's Greatest Songs of All Time. It's even featured in a number of films. Now, the song uh, enlisted background vocals from the New Jersey Mass Choir, It's affiliated with the Gospel Music Workshop of America. The man who wrote the song, who founded Foreigner, Mick Jones, later recalled, we did a few takes and and it was good, but it was still kind of tentative. So then they all got around in a circle, held hands and said the Lord's Prayer. And it seemed to inspire them because after that, we did it in one take. I was in tears. My parents were in the studio with me and it was so emotional. The song spent five weeks at number one in Australia. It also hit the charts in Canada, Ireland, New Zealand, Norway, and Sweden. It peaked at number two in Switzerland and South Africa. And for the entire year of 1985, it ranked number four for the whole year. It was the band's third platinum single in the U.S., first and only gold single in the U.K., and later it was regarded as platinum there in the UK in 2020. So all those years later, the song is still very popular. The powerful chorus goes like this. I want to know what love is. I want you to show me. I want to feel what love is. I know you can show me. Jones rated it as one of his favorite songs he ever wrote. And he later confessed, I always worked late at night when everyone left and the phone stopped ringing. I want to know what love is came at three in the morning sometime in 1984. I don't know where it came from. I consider it a gift that was sent through me. I think there was something bigger than me behind it. I'd say it was probably written entirely by a higher force. Now, I don't know if Mick Jones ever encountered that higher force, but I do know that Foreigner's lead singer Lou Graham came to know Jesus Christ as his personal savior, and he lives for Christ even to this day. He knew what love is. Now, I mention all of that because I believe that song, I Want to Know What Love Is, could be the anthem of the next generation. Really, every generation of young people as they mature, they want to know what love is, True love, real love. They read about it and they hear about it a lot from a variety of sources. But not all of those sources are very reliable. I believe our obligation for the next generation is to teach them about love. They're not going to learn about it on their own. And the sources they're hearing it from today aren't necessarily telling them the truth. I believe this is one area in which the church and many Christian homes have failed. We have not taught our young people what love is. And to some degree, we may not have shown it very much either. Now, to begin, I think we need to start with what love isn't. As I mentioned, young people read and hear about love from a variety of sources, but they're not always hearing the facts. As a Christian group, DC Talk, put it, L-O-V-E isn't all that junk that you see on TV. And that's true. Or in the movies, or in the books, or on the internet, or even in the classroom. So let's take a look first at what love isn't. First, love isn't 
social approval. I, for generations, young people have always wanted to be accepted by their peers. I mean, who doesn't want to be cool, right? We want to be accepted. We want to, we want to be admired. We want, we want people to like us. And in our digital world, many youth measure love by how many likes, how many fans, how many followers they have on social media. But the Bible warns us against this. In 1 John, and by the way, that little letter of 1 John says more about love than maybe any other single book in the Bible. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says what we should not love. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For the everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. You might be thinking, now wait a minute. Doesn't John 3.16 say, for God so loved the world? And here we're told, do not love the world? How does that make sense? Understand that the word world is used in two different ways. John 3.16 speaks of the people of the world. God so loved the people of the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here he is talking about the world system. The world's way of thinking, the world's way of doing things, the world's way of defining things. Do not love the world's system because it's not coming from God. It's leading us away from God. So while we are to love the people of the world, we are not to love the pattern of the world. And especially the way the world defines love. Jesus warned in Luke 6.26, Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how your forefathers treated the false prophets. We want everybody to like us. We want everybody to follow us. We want everybody to speak well of us. Jesus says, be careful about that. Because when you go after people's approval and applause... You're in danger of compromising what you know is right in order to get their approval. And you see it all the time. You see these TikTok challenges where young people are encouraged to do these outrageous things. Sometimes they're very dangerous. They have been deadly at times. Why? So that you can get more likes. So that you can be accepted and approved. That's what the world says you have to do. And when you don't do that, the world wants to cancel you. The world wants to write you off. But Jesus told his disciples in John 15, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, they would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you too. If they obeyed my teaching, they'll obey yours also. Just because people like you, because they click on your posts or your videos, does, that's not love. In fact, John concludes in 1 John 3, 13, Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. If you're truly following Jesus, the unbelieving world will not appreciate you or accept you because love is not social approval. Secondly, love is not sexual attraction. This is probably the biggest lie produced by the entertainment industry. Books, movies, television shows, songs, all equate love with what is really infatuation. 
Infatuation is defined as an immature emotional response to a person of the opposite sex. I think nowadays you can include the same sex. Based on superficial or idealized characteristics rather than the whole person. Built on physical attraction and sexual gratification. That is not love. That is infatuation. But that's exactly what's being pushed as love through our entertainment markets today. And come on, it's not anything new. How many of you folks remember that hit song, Yummy, 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 I got love in my tummy and I feel like loving you. Come on, you remember that song, don't you? Right? Is that really what love is? I mean, it's, it's been going on for a long time. Now, feelings of infatuation can be intense, but they are also very fickle. Consider the tragic story recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 13. 2 Samuel chapter 13, we're introduced to a son of King David named Ammon. I believe at this time Ammon was heir to the throne, next in line to become king. And in verse 1, we are told, in the course of time, Ammon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. So Ammon has fallen in love with his half-sister. And notice how it's described in verse 2. Boy, this just jumps off the page. Ammon became frustrated to the point of illness on account of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Sounds like it comes right out of a Hallmark movie, doesn't it? Or one of those cheap romance novels, you know, that I think they still sell. Oh, I'm so in love. I can't eat. I can't hardly breathe. Whatever. (laughs) So then he has a a friend, Jonadab, who's actually a cousin. Says he was a very shrewd man. He asked Ammon, why do you, the king's son, look so haggard morning after morning? You look like garbage. What's wrong with you? Ammon said, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Jonadab says, hey, I got a scam. I got a scheme. Pretend that you're sick. You're lying in bed and say you'd like Tamar to make some food for you. And when Tamar comes in to give you the food, have your way with her. I mean, that sounds like love, right? You you really love someone, you got to show it. And you've got to have this. I mean, you have needs, right? And that's exactly what happened. He pretended he was sick, asked for Tamar to bring him some food. When she brought it to him, he overpowered her, and he raped her. It says it right in the text. And then look at verse 15. After, verse 14 records, after he raped her, Then Ammon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. And Ammon said to her, get up and get out. Yeah, there's love for you. You won't see that usually on a Hallmark movie. You will see that played out a lot in real life when infatuation is mistaken for love. Oh, it's intense. Oh, that feeling is overwhelming, and I've got to be with that person. I've got to have that person. They mean everything to me, and then when you get them, I can't get away from them fast enough. That's not love. That's hormones. (laughs) And it quickly comes and it quickly goes. Now, don't get me wrong, the Bible is not anti-sex and neither am I. God created sex as a beautiful way to express true love in the right circumstance. 
But it's not all that junk that you see on TV or read in the books or see on the internet. To equate love with sexual attraction is not only inaccurate, it can be very dangerous as well. And then finally, love is not selfish ambition. We saw that in the story of Ammon and Tamar, but it can mean more than just in the realms of sex. There are many ways one person can quote-unquote love another person for selfish reasons, but at that point it ceases to be love because there isn't anything selfish about love. Many would say that the opposite of love is hate. I disagree. I think the opposite of love is selfishness because love is all about the other person. When Paul defines love in 1 Corinthians 13, he writes in verse 5, it is not self-seeking. I like the way the message paraphrases it. Love doesn't force itself on others. It isn't always me first. That's good. That is true love. Not selfish ambition. I don't love you because of what you do for me. I don't love you because you make me look good. I don't love you because you make me feel good. Because that's all about me and that's not love. That's selfishness. Love always puts the other person first. So we must teach the next generation what love isn't. Love isn't social acceptance. It isn't sexual attraction. It isn't selfish ambition. But we, we can't stop there. There are an awful lot of pastors in pulpits like this that will decry those very things. They'll tell you what love isn't, but do we tell them what love is? I think we need to include this in our teaching. What love is? We begin with love is humble service. Jesus described himself in Mark 10, 45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And he didn't just say it. He walked the talk. In John 13, 1, in the upper room, the night before he was crucified, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Now, I want you to think about that line. If this were seen on a TV show or a movie today, how would it proceed? How would he show them the full extent of his love? I guarantee you it's not the way it turned out in John chapter 13. What he did was wash their feet. You'll never see that on a Lifetime Movies for Women, right? But he showed the full extent of his love by humbly serving those he loved. Again, it's not about me. It's not about what you can do for me. It's what I can do for you. And it's not just something you say. It's not just something you feel. It's something you do. John writes in 1 John 3.18, Dear children, let us not love in words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. So much of what our culture calls love is nothing more than words and feelings. There's no substance to them. True love does. True love gives. It serves. It helps. That DC Talk song that I had referenced earlier, the name of it is Love is a Verb, and that is very true. It's not a noun. It's not something you have. It's something you do. Humble service. Love is also honest sharing. Love is based on trust, and trust is based on truth. 
Again, going back to Paul's definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 6 says, Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Verse 7 says, It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Communication is a key in any relationship. That honest sharing is important. It's described in Ephesians 4.13 as speaking the truth in love. Now we've got to balance those. Larry Crabb writes, A great deal of thoroughly self-centered conversation has occurred under the banner of honest sharing of feelings. He goes on to explain, There are times when telling you what's on my mind has nothing whatsoever to do with concern for your well-being. In the development of a relationship, much needs to be left unsaid. Love will restrain me from saying what I judge may hurt you needlessly. Sharing must be limited not only by self-protection, but by sensitive love. There are times when saying what's on your mind and getting it off your chest is not an exercise in love. Now, I'm a big proponent of getting it off your chest. I don't believe you should bottle up your feelings, but find an appropriate place to do it. And what usually happens is when people do bottle up their feelings, it's going to blow eventually, and then it blows all over the people they love, people who don't deserve it. (laughs) See, truth can be a sledgehammer we use to bludgeon people with. Speak the truth in love. Yes, there needs to be honesty, but there also needs to be loving honesty. As 1 Corinthians 16, 14 says, do everything in love. And then love is also holy sacrifice. Paul writes in Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave herself gave himself up for her. J.B. Phillips puts it this way, the husband must give his wife the same sort of love Christ gave to the church when he sacrificed himself for her. Love involves sacrifice. It's going to cost something. Eugene Peterson paraphrased it in the message, Husbands, go all out in love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church. A loved marked by giving, not getting. Oh, wow. That needs to be something we teach the next generation. Love is about giving. It's not about getting. It's not what you do for me. It's what I can do for you. Totally opposite of what they're seeing and hearing out in the world. There's nothing selfish about love. John says in 1 John 3.16, this is how we know what love is. It's almost like he's answering the question that that song posed earlier. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay our lives down for our brothers. You say, yeah, that sounds great. Oh, yeah, you hear about these heroic people that, you know, sacrifice their lives for their family or, or for their brothers or their fellow soldiers on the field of battle. But, you know, how often does that really happen? I think John anticipated that because in the very next verse he says, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Sacrifice is not only laying down your life. Maybe it's sacrificing some of your time. Maybe it's sacrificing some of your money or your possessions. Maybe it's sacrificing your prerogative and let someone else go in front of you. It isn't always the huge things. It can be the small things, but it costs. That's true love. So love is humble service. It's something we do more than something we feel or say. Love is, humble, is honest sharing, balancing truth with love and being open with each other. And then love is holy sacrifice, being willing to put others first, even to the point that it costs us. Then finally... We need to teach the next generation what love looks like. And we do that in the way we live. 
Here the lessons aren't so much taught as they are caught. Instead of just telling the next generation what love looks like, we need to show them by our actions. We need to show them that love is unmerited. We don't love others for what they can do for us. We love them because of who they are. Souls created in the image of God for whom Christ died. And that's everyone. I mean, think about it. When you brought that little baby home from the hospital for the first time, did you say to that child, I love you because of what you're going to do for me? I love you as long as you sleep through the night and don't make too big of a mess. No. See, love is unmerited. It's not something you earn. This is something that God showed us. Romans 5, 6 says, See, just at the right time, while we were still powerless, when we could offer nothing at all to God, God showed his love. Christ died for us. Then in verse 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't anything we did that earned it, merited God's love. Ephesians 2.8, it is by grace you are saved through faith. And not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works so that no one could boast. You don't give somebody a present because they earned it. If they earned it, it's not a present. A gift is something you give that's unmerited. And then that passage read earlier in John 4, 1 John 4. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. What does love look like? This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. True love is unmerited. There's nothing you can do to earn it. It is just given because the person loves. And second, true love is unconditional. We don't love them because they act right or until they do something wrong. Now it's true, love will set boundaries and love has to enforce those boundaries again because we love them. But think of it this way, love does not diminish or disappear because of disappointment. Nothing you can do could make God love you more. Nothing you could do can make God love you less. Think about that. There isn't anything you could do that would cause God to love you more than he already does. And there is nothing you can do that will make God love you less than he already does. That's the kind of love we need to show the next generation. Our children, our grandchildren, the young people around us, that kind of love, unconditional. Richard Halverson, who was the chaplain of the U.S. Senate years ago, said, love is never wasted. It may not get the results or the reaction expected, but it is never wasted. In fact, love that expects positive reaction or results is something less than love. Love never makes any demands. Love only gives And it does not cease giving because there's no reciprocity. The true lover does not require the beloved to meet any conditions. True love is unconditional. The perfect lover devoted himself totally to others, and they crucified him. Psalm 103, beginning in verse 8, puts it this way. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for us, for those who fear him. 
As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. He knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. I love that line. God remembers who we are. We're human. We're not perfect. He loves us. Aren't you glad that God doesn't treat us the way our sins deserve? I know I am. Anybody comes to me and says, God's not fair. I say, thank God he's not. Because if he treated us the way we deserved, we'd be toast. See, God does engage his love on the basis of conditions. With God, it's not, if you perform, I will love you. Or if you fail, I will reject you. His love is unconditional. According to Jeremiah 31.3, the Lord says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I've drawn you in with loving kindness. An everlasting love. It's unconditional. It cannot cease. And the sad thing is, many people in the next generation have no clue what that's like because they've never seen it. Maybe they've heard about it, maybe, but they've never seen it. They've never experienced it. That's on us. That's our obligation to show them what true love is, that it's unconditional. If we want the next generation to accept God's unmerited, unconditional love, we need to show them what such love looks like, even when he wrecks the car, even when she fails the exam, even when he gets cut from the team, even when she gets pregnant, even when he comes out as gay or transgender. Even when she does nothing but argue with you and roll her eyes at you. You love anyway. You love unconditionally. They didn't earn it. They can't lose it. You show them that kind of love because that's what love is. I really believe that song, I Want to Know What Love Is, could be the anthem of the next generation. Because they want to know what real, true love is all about. And we need to teach them that love isn't social approval. It isn't sexual attraction. It isn't selfish ambition. It is humble service. It is honest sharing. It is holy sacrifice. And they need to see, as well as hear, that true love is unmerited and it's unconditional. Because I believe our obligation to the next generation is to teach them about love.